Welcome, everyone. <laughs> um, I'm Hisa. I have my seat here. Um, my name is Hisa Kuriyama. I'm the uh, Director of Humanities at the Radcliffe Institute. And I'm so glad to have Scott here. He's been my idol for, for so many years. Um, I think, it, how, many, how many people is this two for? Yes. Um, is there anybody here who hasn't read Understanding Comics? <laughs> I don't put them on the spot. This is, this, so if you haven't read it, this is the first thing you should do this evening. Yeah. Um, so and let me begin with uh, a question about that. So Understanding Comics, probably your most famous book, mm -hmm. right, um, is a book that makes a wonderful case for uh, comics as an art form, as a serious something that we should take seriously. Uh, but it's also a sort of a treatise on communication. Mm -hmm. as, and, and I want to follow up on this question of communication. And I was very impressed by your talk and the thoughtfulness, not only of the content, but of the presentation. And I'm wondering about how, if you could say something about how you think about like, you, I know you give lectures at many, many places and you're an experienced lecturer and, and shows how your work on comics and, the, and that sort of comic communication has influenced your, the way you present live and, and the differences you see between live presentation and you know, comic uh, com communication? Well, you know, in, in isolating images for panels, what you're trying to do is make sure that you're, you're siloing each idea that you want to get across and you're presenting only what's, what's necessary to get that, that message across. We have a minimalist kind of aesthetic. Now, there are comics, of course, that really lard it up, and, you know, like, and sometimes it can be enjoyable to see all the excess detail and excess unnecessary stuff that's put in there. But the, sort of the default setting for cartoonists is just get it done. And, and when I'm presenting, the, the, one of the things that I try to hew close to is the notion that from the audience's standpoint, if I don't need to think it, I don't need to see it. And I think that that's a principle that we violate often, we being all of society worldwide, when every, and almost everyone is given a PowerPoint presentation at some point. And there's always information on the screen. At any given time, maybe 80% of that screen is inactive in the sense that we're not talking about that now. But there it is. And I think that your eye still drifts up. It looks at that bulleted list, and it looks at item number two and five and and four, even though you're talking about number three. And we have this notion that by adding images, we're adding value to a presentation. But, but you're beginning at a deficit in the sense that you have, when you give a presentation, you have what you have to say. You have the manner in which you're going to say it. You have your vocal inflection. You have your body language. You have your enthusiasm for the subject. Hopefully, you have enthusiasm for the subject. And, and then what are you doing first? You're introducing a distraction. Right? You're introducing something that pulls people away from that. And so if it's not amplifying what you have to say and it's not synchronized what, with what you have to say, it's, it's pulling away. And I think that's, that's where a lot of that sleep-inducing cognitive drag comes from, is the sitting and waiting for them to say X when they're still talking about you know, Y. Or, I did that. It's not in the right order. See, that's going to bug me now. <laughs> so they're waiting for Y while well, they're saying X. I, that was so unnecessary, Scott. Just keep, <laughs> keep on the main road. Um, but yeah, it's, the, it's what I call the uh, why is there a llama on the screen you know, problem. It's just like, we're getting to the llama. Just, just give me 10 minutes. And it has. So uh, another distinctive feature, very striking feature that I'm sure everybody picked up on uh, in your presentation today was the use of the, the pointer, not simply <laughs> to point, right? But almost like, like a magic wand, right? So that okay. th there seems to be a, a sense of something happening live. And this also happened with your animations, right? Something happening live in what is, in fact, a, a prepared presentation. But it, it really enlivens the, um, the presentation because one ha has a sense of something happening. Mm, yeah. Well, I, I, I hope it does. I mean, Ivy makes fun of me for my uh, attachment to the stick. But I love my stick. I love my, um, my uh, 7 sixteenths of an inch in diameter uh, uh, um, uh, Home Depot stick that I have to go and find every time I fly someplace. Um, <laughs> I believe very strongly, this, there's, I promise this will make sense in a sec, but uh, if you look at um, the film Pinocchio, the, the, the old Disney animated film, 
there's a character called the Blue Fairy who shows up at one point. And the Blue Fairy is rotoscoped. Now, rotoscoping is where you take actual live footage of a person and you trace over it. And as soon as she comes on screen, you can tell that she's different. This can be very distracting. There have been films in which rotoscoping was used poorly in a way that was very distracting because all of a sudden it comes from another universe. It comes from another reality. Uh, but in Pinocchio, it works because the Blue Fairy is from another reality. So it's seamless, right? OK, I'm getting to it. I use the stick. I don't use a laser pointer. Because I believe that there are, there are two worlds. Whenever you give any sort of PowerPoint presentation, there are two worlds. There's the world of the presenter, the human being and what they say. And there's the world of the images. You're building bridges. You're building bridges between those two things. That red dot, that damnable dot, everybody becomes a cat when you see that, <laughs> when you see that dot. It is from another reality. And what it happens, it, it foregrounds. It becomes the foreground figure, and everything you in the picture and everything else in the room becomes background. And whereas the stick, the stick following on McLuhan is just an extension of your arm. You know, you see the stick, and it's just like, my arm is not long enough. My arm longer now, <laughs> right? You know, with the extensions of man, that idea. And so I'm building a bridge there. Now, when the, when the screen is low, this screen was a little bit high. I can only reach halfway. When it's even closer, I can interact with it more. But this, is, this goes back to what I was saying in the talk of this notion that there are no neutral visual decisions. One visual decision that's been cast as neutral, I think, throughout the community of presenters is the idea that the separation, the physical separation between screen and speaker is of no consequence, that it doesn't transmit any kind of message. Well, it does. It does. And a close connection between the two transmits a very obvious message once you see it exploited, which I, which I hope I was able to do a bit tonight. Yeah, it was a wonderful demonstration. So uh, this is an example of, of your attention to different media, right? So uh, comics traditionally being a printed form and then you, live pres uh, lecture being a live presentation. Another thing that I know you're very interested in and have worked a long time on is digital the use of the digital in terms of the translation of comics into my, digital my form. My Waterloo, yes. My, <laughs> my uh, attempts to bring about a revolution that's only half uh, finished. <laughs> and and um, I mean, for, for those who haven't read Reinvented Comics, I think that's another work I would recommend. But I also recommend going to Scott's site and seeing his early mm. attempts with, with comics, uh, with, with digital uh, presentation comics. And I'm wondering if you could say something about where you stand now in terms of in, in your early writings on comics, you talk about how it's important to think about the new possibilities that digital uh, storytelling opens up, not, uh, not least the idea of an extended canvas, this, the screen as one long page rather than simply as a series of reproducing um, the printed page. Um, but you also mentioned other possibilities like sound, mm -hmm. interactivity, um, um, link hyperlinks. Um, and I'm wondering where you think you've tried, I'm sure you've tried all sorts of different experiments, where you stand on, on what you think are the, the possibilities of, of digital that, that maybe haven't been fully exploited yet, and where you think maybe still the paper or, or the traditional modes are, are superior. I'll try the three minute version and then I will close Pandora's box as furiously as I can, because <laughs> otherwise I'll be the whole day. Yeah, it was, a, it was a full time obsession of mine for like 15 years or so. Um, in fact, I became obsessed with it right after Understanding Comics came out. That was in 93. And it would be six months until the web went mainstream wow. with the first graphical wow. web browser. So it was the very early days, though I didn't actually publish Reinventing Comics until 99, 2000, yeah. something like that. Um, uh, but in, in short, I believe that the format of comics that we think of as being uh, part and parcel of the art form, the idea of blocking things off into that rectangle we call the page, is a technological decision. It's, it's a decision to fit it into the rectangle. By finding a lot of precursors for sequential art before print, I was able to find lots of examples of things that did not fit into that box. One of the interesting things I found was that they were continuous. Yeah. It's fascinating. If you look at all of these old versions, I'm thinking of certain very specific Egyptian wall paintings, not hieroglyphics, that's something else. But a certain Egyptian wall painting, stuff like Trajan's Column, the Bayou Tapestry, uh, uh, the various codices, pre-Columbian pi picture manuscripts, all these things, you had a single unbroken reading line from beginning to end. 
The codices, they were fascinating. They were accordion folded. So if you spread them out, they, the, the story would just go like that all the way, beginning to end. So the idea was that the story determined the shape. And it seemed to me as if, to a certain degree, printed comics, the technology was, was determining the shape. And I like the idea of freeing it. So many people saw it as imposing new technology upon an art form. But I tried to bring about this awareness that, no, our, our art form is already very much enthralled to a particular technology. We're simply maybe releasing it to take its own shape. And the idea, really just imagine it here out in pure thin air. If I said panel one here, panel two, panel three, panel four, you start to think about the possibilities. One of them being the simple fact that nearly all panels in, in print are the same distance from one another. If you look a century of American comics, the distance between panels in 99.9% .9 of the cases varies between a quarter of an inch and a half an inch. That's it. For any given work, they're usually identical all the way. Well, that is the same frequency. Think of it as frequency. Think of the size and shape of the panel as amplitude, right? So we have amplitude modulation, but not frequency modulation. Well, what happens if this, if this is beat one, beat two, beat three, right? then that would be boom, boom, boom. But what if we separate them? OK, now it's boom, boom, boom. If time equals space, then you should be able to manipulate that. Frequency modulation, that was fascinating to me. But then, of course, you mentioned sound and interactivity. And these things, to me, these were challenges to the very definition of comics. And there were some mutations that I thought were just an off-ramp, right? It's just like, well, this is just a wannabe movie now. I always point at the. Watchmen motion comic, if anyone is probably we've all forgotten that by now. It's, it's ancient history. But you know, there were some things that were just trying to be movies. I wanted to see something that was actually accentuating the qualities of comics. And when you put a comic, a comic sequence, an entire graphic novel all on one massive canvas, hundreds of panels all at once, you are accentuating the thing that's unique about this art form, which is that unlike prose, unlike movies, unlike theater, in comics, it is the entire past, present, and future is laid out all at once. That's unique. We're rising above that landscape of time. It's not true about almost any other narrative form. In almost every other narrative form, it's always now. Past, past, and, past is just memory, and, and future is just anticipation. If I go any further, we're, we're lost. Okay. We're uh, lost. I start to, I, you know, at midnight, I, I sprout horns and things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have tons of other questions, but, but I know that there, there's lots of people who, who would like to ask questions. So I'd like to invite anybody who, who would like to ask a question to, to come up to the microphone. Um, and we, we don't have a huge amount of time for, for, for this, but, but there will be a reception afterwards, at which I'm yeah. sure Scott will be happy to, to speak with you individually. So Absolutely. Oh, you had said something during your presentation that stuck in my head, which was when you showed the six faces and you said that everyone knows this, but we don't really teach this. And I was wondering how it will change people's perceptions when they have sort of a meta understanding of vision. It's like, if I, if I go to a film, I'm not a filmmaker, I follow the story, but if I'm a filmmaker, I'm gonna look at the editing, I'm gonna look at the cuts, I'm gonna look at the camera angles. And I know people who go to films who are schooled that way, who have trouble accepting the story because they're so involved in the, the, the overall, in the meaning of, the, of the, vo the vocabulary of the medium. So what would happen if everybody was always looking at faces and thinking, oh, I see this is a combination of fear and anger and all that? I, I actually think that uh, it, it exists on a slightly different level from, say, film, film literacy. Because literacy, and well, that's maybe not the right word, literacy, but, but an awareness of the inner workings of facial expressions, to me, is like teaching them how your heart pumps blood or how your respiratory system works or the fact that the skin is an organ. These are things that we, we believe are absolutely essential knowledge that we teach children somewhere in the lower grades, you know, maybe around, well, I'm not actually sure. If it's, I'm very old. God only knows when they teach them these days. But um, uh, to me, the notion that the face is the one place where muscles go from your bone to your skin rather than bone to bone, where they do not move limbs. They are an information display. The fact 
that you have this jumbotron of information for a social species like us that, that communicates, that sends signals silently through perturbation, perturbations, that sounds wrong, of skin uh, is, is to me just basic. It's like this is what it is to be alive. Look at what your body is doing to send these messages. That's, to me, that's fundamental. And, and I believe it should be a part of basic education. And also, it is so much fun. I have taught facial expressions to little kids and big kids and college students and adults. And everybody has such a magnificent time. All you have to do is set them the task of communicating with another student a particular emotion, a particular very specific emotion, and then watch if they can get it across and talk about how it could have been done differently. Deconstructing the muscles of the face, oh my god, people freak out. It's so much fun. It's so much more fun than chemistry. And chemistry can be fun. <laughs> That was actually like really perfect to move into the point that I wanted to make and a question that I wanted to ask. When I teach comics, I often teach um, it in, in terms of semiotics and how we have this shared sort of connection to everything like as a culture. Can you talk a little bit about how like, when I look at your book, like I, I don't see that in there a lot of the times. And so I'm like, you know, and there's one thing he left out, you know, like it's semiotic. So like, <laughs> <laughs> so I talk about that. Um, although while I also like have him buy your book and sort of like read it. But um, can you talk a little bit about how um, semiotics sort of works in the way you, you think about these things? Well, you know, in some way, I mean, we could say that, that understanding comics stumbles backwards into semiotics to, to an extent. It was a very, I don't want to say naive, but no, I'll, I, well, you know what, I'll say it. It was a naive work. You know, for instance, Magritte's pipe shows up in there because I had a professor at Syracuse who would use Magritte's pipe in lectures. I thought, well, this is good. This is things art students know. I wasn't even thinking about its origins. Uh, you know, I wasn't thinking, well, closure. I thought, I thought closure was just, closure was this phenomenon that I, I found wider applications for. I wasn't thinking about its origin in, in Gestalt psychology. I, I, I wasn't even aware of it. In fact, for a while, I thought I'd been using it incorrectly. People were telling me, oh, no, that's not how it used, but they were talking about literary theory. And then I had to find out, oh, no, I was using it correctly, but I was using it this way. I, I had to backwards engineer the whole thing. It's only really in the last five years that I've been finally getting up to speed on some of the, some of the thinkers and schools that, that had indirectly informed me. But you know, much of understanding, I mean, I really have to say some of it I just, I really did kind of pull out of my ass. I mean, it was just, I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean, uh, just a sense of direct observation of like, this is how this makes me feel. How could that be? Well, I have just a little bit of this cognitive equipment these tools for thinking that I got at Syracuse as an art student, and now I'm going to see if I can apply those and extrapolate from them. And I came up with things that others found useful, you know, like the, the big triangle especially. But, but it, wasn't, it wasn't from a place of great understanding. And so there are, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of writers on this subject I'm still discovering. But when you pick a subject like visual cognition, oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm still working through that bookshelf. Um, but uh, I do think that you know the study of signs and symbols and 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 just the way that we reduce mentally reduce the world into signs and symbols is fascinating. But it also has a lot of warring factions too. You know, people talking about the futility of meaning and sorting through that can be a, a real minefield. So it's a bit of a rambling answer. But yeah, no, there's a lot missing from the book because there was a lot missing from its author. Um, would you give me your opinion on street signs, highway signs? Um, they, they seem, I mean, they're extremely mundane. They're everywhere, but they're also, I mean, I had to take a driving class recently, so all this kind of hit me like a, like a truck, you know, no pun intended, but they're, they're systematic. Um, they seem very intentional, you know, the way they coordinate colors, you know, reds, a stop sign is an octagon, but a yield is a triangle, you know. What does that mean, <laughs> you know? I mean, it seems as if there's great thought behind it, but it's also very mundane. I mean, our public life depends on it. You know, I mean, you don't, don't drive this way or you'll hit this person. <laughs> I mean, you'll hit this figure if you don't, you know, drive less than 20 miles an hour. And, you know, the use of colors, you know, work, work crews have orange diagonal stripes. And this just seems really artistic and really wonderful and meaningful, and yet it's just very mundane. And I can't help thinking, well, they probably, all these public employees probably didn't all go to design school. 
you know, but they might have because <laughs> well, it's brilliant. The mundanity doesn't doesn't disturb me so much as when when uh, signals are missed, of course, um, because they should be mundane. They should be background noise, um, and I think that. You have to think of it as a collective effort, first of all. Of course, this is the effort of many thousands of people over many years. And so you have people at the, at the, um, the, uh, at the instant of the creation of certain types of signs who are thinking very deeply about it, and then others later on would take their work and maybe misunderstand it, you know, misconstrue what, what the, the value of using a particular shape was, like the man going downstairs. He's a reasonably well-constructed man going downstairs, but for a little weird positioning of the hand. Arm. It does communicate, but the, the, the right to left thing was just, you know, that was just happenstance that people glommed onto. Um, I think, uh, I am fascinated by street signs. There's, a, there's an episode of 99% Invisible with Roman Mars that talks about a man who was so upset by a, a highway sign over a highway in Los Angeles that he snuck there, put on a workman's uniform, um, and, and put up a better designed version of it at the risk to his own life and, quite frankly, the lives of people around him just because it just bothered him, the bad design. Uh, I am bothered when you have an exit-only lane that's, that's marked by, you have, like, a marker for lane, 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 and then you have, like, you have the exit-only arrow, but the arrow is equidistant between the one that is an exit-only lane and the one that isn't an exit-only lane. That's, that's bad and shouldn't happen. Um, I have a long-standing rant against the bike lane signs that have so much space between the word bike and lane that they're committing a kind of proximity infidelity where they are kind of hitting on the wheels of the bike and they're not showing their unity as a, as a thought. But that's just to make room for the bolt. But that's another one that Ivy just tells me to let go. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think signs, I think those things are absolutely fascinating. And, and I think it's long, it's long overdue for a careful evaluation of which practices work and which ones don't. Um, but yeah, there are, basically I think it's people of goodwill and intelligence and understanding, and they are joined by many people who just aren't really thinking about it at all, who are just like given a task and throw something together and get on with their lives. And that's when things go wrong. I, I hope I understood you correctly, because otherwise my question makes little sense, but you gave a a uh, definition of vision, I think, to know what is where by looking. Um, maybe I have to ask Alexander Marr or Aristotle, but I was wondering why where and why not other? Ooh. Well, what is where? Yeah, locating in space and identifying what it is does cover a lot of ground, I think. Yeah, but there's what, there's how, there's who. I mean, if you have vision, you're looking for other things than just where. I just It struck me as... Uh, important, but like narrow. Well, I would say who is included in what, in the sense that the parietal lobe does include things like the fusiform face area. So, so we're using what in the general sense of like, is that my friend Bob or is it a blender? You know, and that's that's happening in the in the temporal lobe. The where in the parietal lobe that the parietal lobe does handle location, but you know when you mention say how. Something like how is it the kind of inquiry that can follow on the initial impulse of vision? I do think that what and where covers a huge amount of ground. Um, but I'm saying really it's just that that definition that it, it arises with Aristotle, but it comes through Mars' phrasing, David Mars' phrasing. But I think that it's, it's remarkable for its economy of expression that in only seven words it covers those four different vital components of the mind. Now, of course, the cerebral cortex has many thousands of functions. But, but vision definitely lives back here. And the parietal lobe definitely does handle things like navigation. One of the cool things about the parietal lobe is that it's monochromatic. I promise I won't get too far into this, but it's cool. Um, so the temporal lobe uses color to identify what things are. But the parietal lobe doesn't really use color. It's, it's monochromatic. And so one of the cool things is that if you have two colors that are exactly the same brightness, you, they start squirming. You can't quite tell where they are. They, they, their location gets all messed up and weird. Um, sorry, that was so unnecessary, but I just, I love it. It's cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I just, I, I, think it's, I think it's good writing, basically. I think I'm very impressed by Mars' seven words, because it's rare that seven words can take you quite so far as, as I think those seven words do. Thank you. Sure. 
Hi. Hi. Uh, you talked a lot about like clarity in images and how we're surrounded by a lot of unclear images. Um, but like some images do definitely mean different things to different people, especially based off culture, background, experience. So I was wondering how that informs your own image making or if you've ran into any instances in which you make an image and it's like misinterpreted beyond what you could have imagined. I'm sure that happens all the time, but of course I wouldn't necessarily know about it because my, my books get my books get translated into a lot of different languages, and I'm sure people are like scratching their heads at this or that panel, but they don't necessarily tell me about it. Um, but to speak generally, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, and there are some things that are very culturally determined. Uh, we're always well off if we can try to focus on the things that are more universal. But for instance, the use of the color red is a classic one in information design. The fact that red often, you know, in the West will mean danger or, or um, you know, equivalent urgency, that sort of thing whereas it may, may mean prosperity in parts of Asia. So, so yeah, there are, there are definitely issues uh, like that. The, I think the quest for a completely universal lexicon of visual symbols is probably futile. One way or another, uh, we're going to run up against those non-universal differences. But if we're aware of them, then at least we can have means of either substitution or interpretation that can help to ameliorate that. And also, of course, many of these things should be being produced locally. Um, it's, you know, much like government, there are things that can be done universally from the top, from a universal sort of authority, and there are things that maybe should be done in a much smaller scale, such as, like, signage in a given town. Oh, can I just say, my favorite new sign, speaking of street signs, somebody on Twitter showed me this. It's, there's two paths that diverge. One is a bike path. Bike path goes to the right. The footpath goes to the left. And there is a sign for the bike path with an arrow going that way, and a sign for the footpath with the arrow going that way, and under the arrow is a little man icon walking this way, and a little <laughs> bicycle driving that way. I love it. Uh, <laughs> on that note, um, so let's all thank uh, Scott McLeod for a wonderful life.